New Guinea is the world's second largest island and it contains one of the largest areas of undisturbed rainforest on Earth. Deep in the lowlands, within the Indonesian province of Irian Jaya, live numerous tribes. Among these are a people who seek refuge from raiding parties and flood by living high in the rainforest canopy. They are the Korowai. There has been virtually no contact with the outside world. There are no villages, just small self-contained clusters of tree houses. This is a story of the Nanduk family clan and the powerful spirit world of fable, sorcery and cannibalism they inhabit. Building toward the sky has long been the Korowai's way of protecting themselves and strengthening their identity. They are among the last groups to withstand an encroaching world, hungry for their island's timber. Dahare and his wife Habil are visiting the Nanduks. But to reach their relatives, they must make the day's walk through the dense forest. Although visiting is common, two days is generally the most a Korowai will venture to travel. <laughs> The forest is their world, providing all material and spiritual needs. It is revered and feared. Clans people feel vulnerable. This is a place where dangerous spirits may lurk behind every bush. Bones underfoot embody memories of animals and people who have died, been hunted, or eaten. The Korowai mistrust the spirit world, and any imbalance in their surroundings is attributed to sorcery. Mm -hmm. 
Two of the Nanduk brothers express their fears with tales of cannibal sorcerers who steal souls. As our people live and eat, we would wonder, has one amongst us become a sorcerer? If so, will he try and eat us? When we are out in the forest and see what look like cassowary or big footprints, we would wonder whether they could really be sorcerers. Someone may be out walking and the sorcerer would creep up behind him, shoot him dead, cut him to pieces and set a meat amongst his sorcerer friends. Old people would say, we must be careful. The sorcerer would tempt men with the meat and the man would think, if we eat this, we too could become sorcerers. We'll give it to our mothers and wives secretly at night, and if the woman throw up, that's it. We would say, it's a good thing the woman ate this and not us. Kahari and Habil are eager to finish their journey as rain is on the way. The name Dahari means palm heart. He heralds their arrival with his signature chant. Uncle Bulawal's house is home to the extended family. The women and children occupy the left half and the men the right. The Korowai expect stability from their environment. Any extremes in weather, poor sago harvest, lack of game, illness even in old age are likely to be put down to sorcery, as are any injustices in the community. The ever-present fear of sorcery continues into the night when dreams and reality mingle. The Korowai believe that sickness and death are caused by being eaten, even as they sleep. The storytelling continues. As we sleep around the hearth at night, the sorcerer would sneak in and eat someone as they slept. He would wake, feeling delirious. We would ask, are you going to die? Yes, I'm going to die. 
who has eaten you? That person so and so has eaten me. His family would cry on and on. We'd bury him beneath his tree house wrapped in special leaves. During the ceremony, we would grab the unsuspecting sorcerer like this, this way, like this. He's running, he's free, he's getting away. <laughs> Eventually, we'd restrain him, beat him to death, and lie him down. We would carry the body along, letting the feet dangle. His head would shake back and forth, bouncing, making little noises as if it was talking. We would throw the body into a stream and cut his throat with a bamboo blade. We would twist his neck and the head would break off. Someone would take a vine and put it in the mouth. The end would come out through the throat. We tied up top. One of us would stand there holding the head and performing. We would split open the body, like how we usually butcher pigs, then pull out all the intestines, would give an arm to one group and the other arm to another group. Another would get a leg, another the other leg. Just like at a festival, we'd arrange the meat on special leaves. Neighboring groups would perform as they returned home, carrying the meat on their shoulders. When we were done eating, we would gather the bones and put them where parts met as a sign. From day until night and through to the morning, we would beat the walls. Then the sorcerer's relatives would ask us for compensation, dog's teeth, pig's teeth, and cowrie shell money. We would shake hands, eat and drink together, and say, yes, he was a sorcerer so we won't be demanding anything more. Yao, a quiet man and the eldest of the three Nandok clan brothers, is planning a grand party, a celebration of the Sago Palm. <laughs> <laughs> the sago palm is central to the Korowai society. Every part is used one way or another, and starch from the processed trunk provides the staple food. Each tree is individually owned, but the land on which it grows is communally owned. Once the festival host has felled the first one, men from related and neighboring clans join in to help. The Sago Grub Festival offers great prestige for the host and can be held for any number of reasons. To celebrate a wedding, to demonstrate one's wealth, or to appease neighboring clans after a disagreement. In this instance, it is to enhance the fertility of the Sago crop. Clearing mature palms to make way for new shoots.
As many as 100 trees are felled for a festival, but not for their starch. Yao and friends prepare the wood for rotting. They split and wrap the felled trunk tightly in its own leaves. Rotting sago palm is the perfect environment to encourage the Capricorn beetle to lay its eggs, which in turn produce larvae, the sago grubs, which the Korowai consider a great delicacy. These will be cooked and served to guests at the party. <laughs> Many weeks of tropical heat and rain will pass before they return to harvest the grubs. For Yao, this means a wait of about three moons. Yao lives alone. He lost his wife to another man ten years ago. In most such cases, clans people would either mount a raiding party or negotiate compensation such as dog's teeth, cowrie shells, or a pig. Yao has received nothing. If his sago grub festival is successful, it may help him regain some self-respect. <coughs> Yao and his nephew Fuari return to his treehouse. The Nanduk cluster has three treehouses. Bulawal, the middle brother, and his family live across the clearing in the most substantial house. It serves as the center for most social activity. This is a male-dominated society that lacks any rigid rules of hierarchy. Old age is respected but offers no political seniority and everyone pitches in according to their talents. In a clearing not far from the treehouse cluster, Yao and his brothers have built a long hut for the festival. In the center is a large platform where all the food for the party will be stored. As the weeks pass, more helpers gather. Arriving guests socialize in the hut and sleep in temporary encampments. Meat is an all-important supplement to the diet. Ndahi and Fuari, Yao's nephews, choose a place to build a trap for wild boar. Well, 
No part of the sago palm is wasted. Here, its bark hairs are the bait. Pigs are frequently offered as marriage dowry or compensation. And a piglet found pining near a trapped mother will be reared as a family pet until eaten or traded. It may well be nursed alongside a child. The pig is highly prized and is believed to embody many human attributes. For a culture such as the Korowai, there is healing value in eating specific body parts. Fish is also popular, and the boys collect bait for fishing. Grasshopper is best. Legs are removed in order to immobilize them. The juiciest are saved for a tasty snack later. Fishing hooks and line, steel axes, machetes and tobacco are the only goods traded with outsiders. Line fishing is the first hunting skill young boys master. The catch provides a vital source of protein in a starch-heavy diet. <laughs> Meanwhile, Yonali and his cousin repair a dam and set fish traps. <laughs> <laughs> the cone-shaped traps made from strips of sago bark pierce the wall of sago leaves creating the only channels for the water to flow, trapping the larger fish. Freshwater crayfish is the favorite catch. There is a practical use for everything the forest has to offer especially the sago palm. Every part has many applications.
The young boys make disposable arrows from the spines of sago leaves. The notched stepladder to the treehouse veranda is detached at the bottom so that movement of the pole at the top acts as a warning of approaching visitors. Apart from being a lot of fun, shooting practice is good preparation for adulthood. Yo, 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 the men have an excellent knowledge of anatomy and with the aid of a stone axe and a split bamboo blade the carcass is cleanly divided for distribution. Situated just below the equator, this tropical forest is among the wettest and most humid places on Earth. Rarely a day passes without heavy rainfall. The pork is put on a bed of sago flour reconstituted from the tree's palm trunk. Then it's wrapped in leaves to retain moisture and sandwiched with hot stones. Yao and others of the family gather at Bulawal's treehouse to cook and eat their share of the kill. Meat is a luxury, and the smell of cooking fills the air with anticipation. <laughs> Tahare puts the package onto the fire to bake. Everyone smokes locally grown tobacco until the meal is ready. <laughs> Mm 
Coral eye cooking can be a hazardous business. Two years ago, an exploding hot rock cost Yonali an eye. When a bamboo knife becomes blunt, a layer of skin is peeled off and it is once again razor sharp. The conversation turns to the possibility of a new sorcerer in their midst. Mm-hmm. <laughs> After eating, the Korowai lodged the bones in the treehouse roof as mementos. They embody special memories and spiritual meaning. Agility is valued in this environment, and young boys exploit their climbing skills to the full. Jungle greens, root vegetables, and fruits of the forest, such as breadfruit, are a welcome addition to the diet, though not always that easy to reach. Yao fells one of his sago palm trees. A new tree is felled whenever sago runs short. But now it is nearly festival time and he plans to have plenty on hand for the guests. A tree takes about 15 years to mature and seeds are planted regularly. Everyone is involved. Sayak, Yao's elder sister, has returned to the Nanduk cluster after the death of her husband. 
No one retires in this society. The old remain active in decision making and labor as long as they are able. The men sit and weave fish traps while the women pound the pith with stone hammers. <laughs> The women are responsible for raising children, but this does not preclude them from hard manual work. The men hunt, wage war and build. The women take care of the home and forage in the jungle for foods and medicines. Each month they break from this routine and seclude themselves in the forest for the period of menstruation. Sago starch is washed from the wood pulp and filtered in a trough made from the rigid stem of a leaf. When drained, it leaves blocks of sago starch that can be cooked directly in the fire or wrapped in packages with meat or grubs. The women return to the festival hut with the fruits of their labor. Yao, as party host, collects and distributes food from the center of the hut, an honorary position he will occupy throughout the festival. As in the tree house and elsewhere, the women and men establish their own separate space. This is not strictly enforced, and during festival there's ample opportunity for flirtation. <laughs> Yonale is already in party mood. He's wearing his cockatoo feather, a sure sign of pride which women may find manly. <laughs> The festival is imminent. To look their best, girls make new grass skirts out of young sago leaves. The bones from bats' wings are popular as nose ornaments. 
both women and men will adorn themselves with anything attractive their surroundings have to offer. <laughs> There is a tale for every occasion. Life is reflected and traditions are explained in the telling of stories. Two sisters lived in a high house at the top of a bayam tree, so high up that their door looked very small seen from below. One day, they went and split open sago trunks to look for grubs, and then they went to their garden to gather bananas and other produce. Fixing up the stone axes, they went to work on their garden. They gathered sago grubs and picked red fruit. The older sister scarified her belly very beautifully making three rows of burns, and in her nose she put beautiful wing feathers of a bird. It's the day before the guests arrive and time for the grub harvest. Yao's first tree is stripped and pulled apart with disappointing results. Many cocoons are empty, and he's worried that they have harvested too late. They went and gathered food and brought it home to cook. The elder sister didn't eat because she was thinking of a special man. She said, I wish I was eating with my man, Sembluke. The women have more luck, and grubs are quickly separated from cocoons. The sisters went to the sago swamp, where there was sago with edible hearts and birds swarming noisily, drinking juice from the sago flowers. When the elder sister was ready to go to meet Zembluke, the younger sister said, don't meet with anybody else, just go to your men upstream. And with that, threw pig's intestine all over her and she became covered in awful sores. Now, no man who met her on the way would be tempted to take her. The bride-to-be arrived at the banks of the island and river, threw leaves in the water and said, I wish this were a canoe, and the leaves turned into a canoe. She paddled until evening when she met many men and women. Some were beautiful and some had ringworm. The children cried, Father, Mother, there's a spirit coming, and they all ran away. They found a man some blue further upstream and said to him, Friend, there's a spirit coming from downstream looking for you. Sembluke said, That's my wife. I'm going to marry her. The next day, Sembluke felt Sago Palms as a diary, and he and the spirit woman agreed to marry. Sembluke said to his wife, I'm going to look for red fruit over there. The wife saw a red fruit nearby and was going to pick it, but it fell and hit her on the head, miraculously wiping out the sores, making her wounds disappear. Her man came back and said, Where's my spirit? I'm right here. No, you are totally different from her. You are beautiful. They argued a while, and finally the man said, Fine, and he picked up some red fruit and gave it to her. They walked together, the man and the very beautiful woman. Soon after, he felled sago trees for grubs and invited all his people to come help build a festival hut. They stayed until the grubs were ready and they made platforms on which to sow sago. They collected grubs all day, wrapped them in packages, and gave them to the relatives who had helped, so they could eat first. Preparations are complete. Hosts and helpers can hear the distant chants of the arriving guests. The 
guests emerge from the forest chanting and performing a traditional war dance. Dressed as if for combat, the visitors and hosts perform in separate groups in a mock war dance. Yao oversees the food preparation which continues throughout the day and into the night. To complete nature's cycle, the men return the old wrappings to the forest with a ceremonial dance. Everyone eats their fill. After roasting, some of the grubs are mixed with sago starch and baked into giant pancakes. There really were a lot of people, grandparents and grandchildren, 
and elder brothers and younger brothers all joined in happily, wearing their string bags and penis sheaths and other decorations. They performed on and on, and then slept. <coughs> <laughs> From our ancestors to our parents and until now, we make gardens to plant sago and we build a long festival house to perform the bow play and dance. From then until now, we hold festivals. Because of what our ancestors have done in the past, this father Yao has also taught in the same way and he has brought you and you have seen an example with your own eyes.